Good morning. Hi, and uh, welcome to the Fund Forum webinar, the DOL Fiduciary Rule. What does it mean for your business? Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Lauren Fox. I'm the Director of Research at Ignite Research. Uh, I'm going to be joined today uh, by two expert panelists, Mike Beer, who's the President and CEO of Principal Funds, and Craig Phillips, who's the Head of International at Core Data Research. Um, now, this is a preview discussion in advance of the Fund Forum Next Gen Distribution Conference. That's a live conference. It's being held in Boston at the end of October. Um, it's a great opportunity for learning and networking. I encourage you to, um, if you haven't registered, find out more information about it. Uh, we are also live tweeting this uh, webinar. So if you follow hashtag F as in fund, F as in forum webinar, we encourage people to tweet us or tweet uh, anything about this. And um, we are live and taking questions from the audience. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please send them to us using the ask a question button at the bottom of your screen. We are here to talk about the new Department of Labor fiduciary rule. Um, now this, uh, just to explain some of the key points of the fiduciary rule or remind folks, this is going to apply the fiduciary standard to all retirement accounts, including those covered by ERISA. It's also extending the fiduciary standard for the first time to individual retirement accounts, including IRA rollovers. So the two big parts of the business to be affected are DC plans, defined contribution plans, and IRAs. And the IRA aspect is what makes this relevant for just about every advisory practice in the U.S. Now, the fiduciary standard commonly means that all client-specific advice must be in the best interest of the client, not merely suitable for the client, and the advisor must act with prudence. Advisors in the firms must be acting as fiduciaries uh, and also have policies to ensure that they are acting as fiduciaries by April 10th of next year. And then lastly, the fiduciary rule does include a contract to allow advisors to get variable exemption that might uh, provide some conflict of interest. It's called a best interest contract exemption. Uh, firms must have those documents and policies in place to address that potential conflict of interest situation by January 1st of 2018. Uh, as one can imagine, this is causing uh, a lot of change already within the industry. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about, and my first question to Craig, because this is uh, quite a big change for several segments of the industry, Craig, uh, you know, how are advisors digesting and dealing with new regulation? Uh, you know, what, what, what's your perspective on that? Okay. Thanks, Lauren. Um, well, I, I guess if we take a step back just to begin with, um, and if we look at this regulation on a, uh, from maybe a more, um, international perspective or from from a, from a global industry perspective um i mean we we we've seen a phenomenon that's been developing over you know the, the, the quite a while now which is the this shift of onus away from uh, i guess centralized um retirement planning or investment planning that type of stuff um putting the onus onto the individual and that's you've you've seen that through the rise of the, the whole dc market and the, I, I guess the the ongoing demise in, in the db space um, so I guess the, just, just to put the regulatory change into context there, it, it makes sense um, that, that, that new protections will be brought in to, if the onus is on the individual to make these decisions or to seek professional advice to help them make those decisions, then obviously it needs to be in, in their best interest. Um, so so that, that's the first stage. And then if we look at, um, uh, I guess, then if we look at the, the concept of change um, just more broadly, and, and, I'll, and I'll kick off as, as, as you do with these things with, with a quote. Um, so if we, if we look at it through the eyes of, say, truth, so all truth passes through three stages. Um, so first, it, it's ridiculed. 
Um, secondly, it's then in some cases uh, it's opposed, some cases violently opposed. Uh, and then thirdly, it's uh, it's accepted finally as being self-evident. So, if we if we if we talk about change, there is something called the the, the cycle of acceptance. Um, so there's normal existence, which is you know everyday operating, and then something comes in a change factor. In this case, the the DOL um, standard. Um, so there's the receipt of the bad news and and groups, different stakeholders within the industry deal with that in different ways. Um, initially, it's it's a notion of denial. Uh, in some cases, it then turns into anger. Um, in some extreme cases, aggression. Um, after that, we fall into, you know, there's depression. Um, then there's bargaining, you know, lobbying, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and to be honest, in this case, some of that happened before before the announcement, as you saw with some of the, the watered-down notions in, in the regulatory change. Um, and then I guess finally is acceptance. So if we, if we look at it from in terms of how advisors are, are, are dealing with, with that change and um, drawing on some examples for, from overseas, um, I guess the one the one difference at this point is uh, the changes that we've seen, for example, in uh, the UK, uh, South Africa is is about to introduce uh, ban at the first phase of it. It's moved towards banning commissions um, in, in, in on first of January 2017. Um, Australia recently, uh, you know, the last few years has introduced uh, something called FOFA, which was again banning on commissions. So I guess the US is is, is taking a bit of a, a half step in that direction because this rule doesn't necessarily outlaw. Uh, commissions, as, as everyone knows, it it, it just um, you have to have a contract in place to to, to allow that to happen. So, typically, what we're seeing from advisors are that they do feel that they're going to be impacted quite significantly. Um, I've got some data here which which I can draw on, which talks about. Um, 49% of U.S. advisors, for example, agree that uh, increased regulations restrict their ability to provide the desired level of service to their clients, um, which is actually below global. This is based on global advisor research that we've done. Um, although 50% and 50 of U.S. advisors agree that the increase in regulation is in the investor's best interest in the long term. Um, but obviously, there's there's, there's implications. Uh, there's, there's other data which I'll draw on later in the conversation. But essentially, at this stage, the the different segments, uh, obviously, the RIAs, um, you know, they they've been living in this space for a while, so less in terms of change, not 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 too much of a change for those guys. Um, the, the the independent broker dealers, I guess, the you know, there's the, the, there's quite a lot of um, bargaining for, for for them to do, or as they move towards that process of of, of acceptance. Um, I guess the the manufacturers, the insurers, and the and, and the manufacturers. Um, uh, I mean, Mike can maybe talk about about this, but I mean, I, I might hint that there's a little bit of. Uh, not not aggression, but maybe a, a bit of anger or frustration about how it's going to impact them and, and their businesses, um, and, and that's kind of it at this stage, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you know what's interesting to to build on your point is that the first deadline, that April 10th deadline, uh, is still a number of months off, but already firms are starting to get into the acceptance mode and starting to deal with the change and plan for the change. Um, Ignite's research did a survey of uh, a group of advisors called the Financial Times 401. These are adv financial advisors who specialize in uh, advising DC plans. Um, and what we found was that uh, half of the specialist plan advisors are already planning to meet with plan sponsors to explain the impact of the fiduciary rule on them. And in many cases, the meetings have already started to take place. And another 17% of these plan advisors say they will very likely conduct these meetings. Um, and if you look at this slide, um, many of them already are planning to conduct uh, reviews of the mutual funds that they're recommending in their clients' DC plans. Um, you know, with a new perspective under the fiduciary rule um, and looking also at service providers and, and already thinking that uh, change is going to come. Uh, with that context, I want to ask a question to Mike Beer, president of Principal Funds. You know, Mike, you know, what is, what is Principal's perspective on trying to uh, help advisors at this stage 
make that transition to the rule, uh, era of the fiduciary rule. Thanks, Lauren. Um, yeah, a couple of comments on that. If you look at our business, we've, we've had we've historically had a very significant presence in both the 401k and the IRA space, and so. In the 401k space, a lot of these advisors have been fiduciaries even before the rule. But we're finding now is a lot of these firms are, are looking for us to help them navigate uh, what this new best interest contract looks like. We actually have a very sizable team of, of people here at the Principal Financial Group that are very intimate with the details of the rule. And so we are actually helping some of the firms as far as our interpretation of, of the rule and what they need to do to adapt. I think the, the, the thing we're being very careful about is most of these firms don't want you talking directly to their advisors because they're still working, you know, from a legal perspective on, on how to position the best interest contract, uh, what advisors are going to let become fiduciaries because not all these advisors will become fiduciaries or they'll have to kind of go through certain standards to become a fiduciary. So we're spending a lot of time uh, with the firms and their, their home offices to try to help them at least our interpretation of the new rules. And a lot of this comes down to also uh, restructuring compensation. As a lot of these distributors are trying to move more from a commission-based uh, process and, and a form of payment to a fee-based form of payment. So some of the product sales that historically have been commission-based, uh, they're looking to have us work with them to change some of those, uh, some of those compensation uh, techniques into more of a fee-based approach versus commission-based. Hmm. Um, quick question, a follow-up question for you, Mike, um, and that is, you know, do you think that more of the change is going to be happening on the retirement plan side or more of the change will be happening uh, in the more general advisory space where folks are dealing with the, you know, fiduciary standard being applied to IRAs? Yeah, def definitely on the individual uh, retirement account side, Lauren. Uh, again, like I said, a lot of the 401k advisors have been used to some, some form of fiduciary standard in the past, and where this has really caught the advisors, uh, I wouldn't say flat-footed, but as far as the biggest change is more from the retail perspective, and then it gets a little awkward as far as how you bifurcate your business between an IRA rollover account and just a regular non-qualified account, uh, Lauren. So definitely more on that pure retail side. Yeah. Okay. And um, switching back to Craig, Craig, you know, can you talk yeah. a little bit about what this might mean um, both for advisors but also for investors? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I guess um, the, from the advisor's point of view, um, it, it does have some impact. I mean, we, we, we've seen globally um, – this sort of shift towards outsourcing um, as you know some of it is because of uh, as we've seen this move away from commission to fee based in other markets um, I mean obviously there's a very strong fee based market inside the US as well but you know the the, 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 the notion of where the proposition is or where the value add is for the advisors um, as you look across the whole value value spectrum of of um, you know the different providers from manufacturers down to administrators, I mean everybody nowadays is really trying to justify their worth, um, and you see it with the you know the the passive active debate on the, on the asset management side. Um, so I guess in in, in that context, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a lot of advisors are you know they've not necessarily shift, but but more advisors are now shifting to this idea of focusing specifically on the on the, on the planning aspect. Aspect. So there's less of the, the the kind of product side of things, um, which, which kind of uh, I wouldn't say com commoditizes the product, but it certainly has shifted the notion away from a product to a solutions conversation. So I think this this change is is just going to be another nail in the coffin in in that regard. But if you add in the over. Um, I mean, Mike mentioned there some of the the, the, the legalities that the, 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 the his clients are, are sort of working on to sort of grapple with these changes. Um, if you look at the notion of de-risking generally, then you know we probably will see um, so some of some some of that coming through. So, does that mean more less tailoring um, or, or less risk being taken by by the advisor businesses because they're 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 worried that you know it might come back to bite them? So you know, do they look for more generic? Um, 
cookie cutter type solutions but it's kind of a chicken and egg because if they start to do that then the perception of the value add might shrink and you know so it, it's a very fine line for advisors to 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 um to to, to walk um in terms of trying to add that value add to clients but also not expose themselves and in a lot of cases it might not actually be driven by the advisors it might be the home officers i mean they might have you know we see in other markets where compliance kind of takes over um, and then once that happens, it puts the advisors in a really difficult situation. I mean, for example, um, I mean, we've done research uh, in the past where we've looked at sort of if you just break down an, an advisor's typical day of how, how they spend their time um, with, with various things, you know, meeting with clients or managing existing clients and so on. So globally at the moment, um, advisors spend about 19 percent of their time either doing what we call general administration or uh, regulatory compliance. And, and regulatory compliance um, relating to industry regulations, obligations, that's about 8% of their time, and the general admin is about 11 But if we look at the UK, which had uh, the Retail Distribution uh, Review, RDR, that came into force a few years ago, um, the UK advisors, in, in you know, sort of a few years after that, they were spending almost, I wouldn't say double, but 31% of their time was on admin and compliance, um, as opposed to the 19% globally. So it's it's tough um, in terms of. So what 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 might might that mean? I mean, as we go through the conversation and 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 and, and this webinar, you know, the impact it's going to have on, you know, if that raises costs, the impact it has on lower lower balance. Um, clients, you know, the, the the ability for advisors to service those guys, um, the impact on, uh, I mean, some guy, some client advisors that have, um, you know, they, 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 they might be a bit too long in the tooth to shift from um, from from how they've been operating into new 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 ways. So that might accelerate even folks leaving the industry. Um, so there's, you know, re different reasons people leave the industry. One is just because their businesses can't compete, but because sometimes the change is too hard. So we might see some of that stuff. Um, I mean, Mike started to touch on the, the shift in, in the product conversation and, and, and that. So I think that's one. And then maybe at a firm level, um, you know, mer merging, you know, do we see the rise of these kind of um, not Uber in the in, 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 in the company's sense of the word, but the, 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 the actual meaning of the word, these sort of Uber businesses as, as they become bigger and bigger and start to swallow more of these firms that might look to sell off because, you know, because of those risk things that I talked about so um, and that's a global phenomenon that's not just in the US that that, that is happening around the world hmm. um, an interesting question kind of side question that this raises uh, I'd like to direct to Mike and that is you know we've talked about how the uh, effect of the tissue rule it's not going to be even for all firms some firms have more experience or less experience uh, acting as fiduciaries does this regulation change your uh, uh, the distribution strategy at a firm like Principal in terms of making uh, kind of changing your priorities for for uh, who you're working with or who you're devoting more attention to. Yeah, Lauren, a couple of comments and, and one first just to piggyback on some of uh, Craig's conversations. There was a an article today in Ignites that talked about uh, that 10 percent. Uh, of investment advisors do plan on leaving the business because of, of this rule. And I mean, that's pretty hard hitting. And, and if you look at, you know, the average age of most of the U.S. advisors um, out there is over 50. And I think to, to Craig's point, a lot of these people just are looking at this and saying with that, you know, increased uh, fiduciary liability, the increased workload and compliance that, that the 10 percent are at least indicating or hinting that they may leave the business. Um, and more, I guess, as far as other changes that, that we see is that as far as focus is that, again, a lot of these firms are looking at, um, at what I would call kind of a, a review and a little bit of a cleanup on their platforms. And so, you know, most broker dealers are offer hundreds of mutual funds. A lot of firms are either doing this themselves with their research departments or they're hiring third parties like a Morningstar, for example, to look at their platforms and they're actually streamlining these. And so it does put more focus on, on mutual fund manufacturers to you know, become uh, more engaged with these, these research departments. And it doesn't mean that you're still not working you know, hand to hand with their advisors through your wholesaling teams, 
but we do feel that longer term, more of the product selection as far as what the advisors can choose from and some of the asset allocation models that they work with are going to be driven more from the home office and from these research platforms at each of these distributors. Mm. Yeah. Can can I just jump on the on the back of that, mm -hmm. um, Lauren? Yeah. Um because sorry, you asked me before also what does it mean for clients and I didn't really touch on that. So just just to sort of expand on on, on where Mike got to there with, with, with the um I guess the the home office, uh, whether you know, model portfolios or, or, or what whatever kind of research stuff they're putting in place. Um what one angle that, that from the client's point of view is then um I mean, there's, there's, uh, I've got data here which looks at the number of advisors that say that low balance clients will, um, you know, will be the kind of one of the, one of the early um, uh, groups to suffer uh, as a result. So, in just just flipping back over the the um, the, the pond to, to the UK, we did see the rise of this notion of um, of the advice gap as uh, as regulation or the the, the shift from commission to fee-based uh, pushed out um, whether it was people's propensity to pay for advice or whether it was their um, the, the advisor's inability to charge at a rate that people could stomach um, and, and this is different in the US because it's uh, you know it, it is that kind of middle ground between you know ruling out commission and just sort of the general shift towards it um, essentially what what, what 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 we think could happen then is I mean the technology is is, is playing catch-up at the moment you know that if you look at the robo arena um, there's certainly a demand for advisors to to offer automated platform um, advice as it were to to, to customers um, but I think there's a, there's, it's not necessarily quite where it needs to be at this stage, but that doesn't mean it won't get there quite quickly um, with, with, with the, developments, the developments that we're seeing in AI and those types of things. But I think it's how do advisors continue to engage in some capacity with, with, with all their clients um, in post these changes. Um, so, so rather than lose people to a direct sort of offer as opposed to an intermediated um, offer, um, we think that there's certainly a lot that the industry can do to 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 support advisors in in that regard. Um, and then at the other end of the equation as well, it's you know if you look at the more high balance clients, it doesn't necessarily mean that these guys, um, you, you, you know, are, 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 because they've got high balances that they're necessarily uh, more likely to to stay with advisors. So. Um, Advisors always talk about chasing the, the the money in terms of you know the more affluent clients, but I think it's kind of a combination of technology, um, technology and service, which which is what what the implications are, and that that's where the advisors really need to 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 work with groups in the market to to, to help them to deliver that to clients, the the sort of the service with, and if you look at the you know the gamification in in other markets, I mean the, the, this industry can't 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 be isolated from that broader evolution that you're seeing across other industries. So I think that's where advisors will look um, to, to to various providers to, to support them in that regard. Uh, and it'll be very interesting to see, um, you know, to your point, Craig, uh, which I think is a good one, how technology and, and things like the robo-advice uh, phenomenon uh, react to this new regulation. Um, I do want to remind the audience to use your Ask a Question button to submit questions to us. And I also very much want to uh, have time to, to talk a little bit about the impact of the Fujifu rule on product. Um, so uh, just quickly, again, uh, this is based on a survey that we did of the FT401 DC plan advisors. Um, you know, there is this expectation that the fiduciary rule is going to increase the, uh, the trend towards low cost or at least increase the, the – heighten the scrutiny of costs of, of investment products, particularly in D.C. plans. And we asked them, you know, which products are you planning to use more in the wake of the fiduciary rule? Uh, if any, 26 percent of the advisors said they're going to use index equity mutual funds even more because of the fiduciary rule. That makes a lot of sense, of course, because index uh, equity funds cost less on average than actively managed index funds. Um, and then similarly, 23% are planning to use products mixing active and passive. Again, that's you know, a result of, of uh, that reflects the, the, uh, 
the focus on cost and then also index fixed income mutual funds, which are also uh, um, cheaper than actively managed mutual funds. Um, again, not saying that actively managed funds uh, are going away, but definitely seeing uh, at least these these specialist plan advisors saying they're definitely going to be increasing their use of uh, passive uh, within their the DC uh, plans that are their clients. Um, so question to you, Mike, uh, product, do you see, do you expect an impact and are you even hearing anything from clients of yours already um, about the kinds of products um, that are going to get a boost from in demand from the fiduciary rule? Yeah, Lauren, maybe let me uh, cover a couple um, high points here as far as from the product front. As obviously, you, you've seen you know, some of the industry trends towards you know, passive uh, away from active. And, and there's a couple things that, again, we would probably caution everybody about is that it, it, you got to be careful that it's not just about cost. And in the end, it's still the, the total performance that you're, you're really trying to drive to to get you know, customers to save for the needs that they have. But that, that said, I do think a lot of advisors uh, will kind of default to lower cost as kind of a safety net. Again, we've talked about some of the, the liabilities that exist out there with becoming a fiduciary, and the easy answer could be that you always default to the lowest cost. So that said, you know, some of the things, Lauren, that we're looking at is, you know, there's obviously places where index may be more efficient, like in the more efficient asset classes, like large cap blend, for example, and you want, as an active manager, which we are principal, we want to focus more on those areas, whether it be, you know, multi-asset strategies, uh, real estate, uh, high yield, or, or strategies where it's not as easy to be replicated by an index. So you definitely, I think, will see trends towards passive and asset classes that make sense to be passive. And active managers are going to have to spend more time focusing on those asset classes that are not easily replicated by passive because there's no doubt that cost, the expense ratio of your funds is moving up. And as far as I mentioned, these research platforms, when they're looking at screening funds, they're actually looking at performance and the total expense ratio as fairly equal factors when determining the platform of, of funds that they're going to offer. The second thing I might mention, Lauren, is we are seeing a little more migration as far as more uh, efficient wrappers. When I say that, uh, CITs and ETFs, and you have ETFs in your in your slide here. Uh, but we're on the qualified plan side. We're probably seeing as much traction with CITs. Again, uh, CITs have a little more uh, efficient cost structure as well as ETFs. And so, if you look at you know longer term. I think you're going to see a lot of firms will focus a little more energy around their CIT and their ETF platforms. It doesn't mean that 40 act funds are, are dead by any stretch, but again, in, in this guise of looking at uh, places where you can be more cost efficient, uh, these wrapper CITs and ETFs do have a more efficient cost structure. And it's interesting that you mentioned CITs. Um, you know, another question that we had asked the plan advisors in our research, one-third of them said that they plan to increase their use of CITs within uh, qualified DC plans. Um, but, you, you know, you talk about um, how the 40 Act funds aren't going away, and I think we all agree on that. Um, but there also could be some relative winners within the different kind of structures that are available within the mutual fund. So, uh, from your point of view, are there some mutual fund share classes that are going to benefit more than others from the fiduciary rule, or at least see more demand? Yeah, Lauren, definitely. If, if you look at uh, trends we're already seeing, a lot of firms have already gone on record to say that they're going to switch out um, A shares from their fee-based advisory accounts and have those substituted by share classes that do not have a 12B1 fee. So longer term, um, if you look at, again, the trends and, again, the DOL leanings towards fee-based and lower cost, uh, you will definitely see, we think, some you know atrophy of A shares and C shares. Uh, we don't think this will happen overnight, uh, but you're definitely going to see uh, trends away from the retail commission base A and C shares to share classes that do not have a 12B1 fee. Um, also, we've, we've had a lot of dialogue with distributors that are looking for creating 
um, an A share class that's generic across uh, for all of their advisors because today they're looking to create something that there's no bias in the A share that a Merrill Lynch advisor sells with uh, Franklin funds versus principal funds. So a lot of these firms are approaching the manufacturers to say, can you uh, basically engineer an A share class that looks like this for our advisors so they don't have any biases built into when they sell an A share because today some some manufacturers have a 5.5 maximum front end load, some might have four and a half. So the these distributors are looking to try to remove as many biases as they can from their advisors. Hmm. Well we uh that's I think it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um clearly a lot of folks uh, certainly asset managers, service providers, and and folks on the advisory side are looking to see um, the the kind of ripple effect on investment products, um, in addition to, of course, the ripple effect that we've, we've already talked about with, you know, service and technology. Uh, we've hit the half hour point. Yes? Uh, Lauren, sorry, just just before you, you move on, can I, can, I, can I just add in there, just while we're talking about costs, so... I mean, almost 80% of U.S. advisors do agree that the increase in regulation will likely lead to an increased cost for the client. So I think in this day and age, I mean, where we are in the cycle as well um, and where, we're he- where the pr- predictions are for where we're heading and, uh, and the kind of likely returns that people should be expecting, um, there's, certainly a, a, there's certainly a challenge for advisors. In t- I mean, 73% of advisors feel that the regulatory requirements will limit the access limit access to financial advice for low and middle income clients which is what I was sort of touching on earlier um, mm-hmm. so the, the, the type of stuff that Mike's Mike's on about there uh, talking about um, I think that's quite important that the industry I mean we don't want to go down that rabbit hole where where we just focus on cost and it's a bit a race to the bottom it's really around that um, that, that that value add and, and where it where, where on the manufacturing side of the equation can that value be be, be, be got because if if costs are obviously rising for whether it's the the client or the advisor business or the or, or any of the providers along along the spectrum, then something needs to be created somewhere to allow those costs to be absorbed. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, you know it's going to be open open market for, for for new providers to come in that do things differently, who can do it at a lower cost. It's going to see lots of people leave uh, uh, you know or not not have the the, the advisors aren't going to be able to, to, to offer the appeal for, for people to, to come to them. And, and really, as an industry, we don't want to be having that sort of mature stage market conversation around cost. So the industry needs to do everything it possibly can to, to focus on value rather than flipping the, 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 the sort of head onto, uh, onto the notion of cost, because the costs are only ever going to rise. So the value needs to expand at a pace which, which outstrips that cost. And, you know, I totally agree. I think that's a great point that um, uh, for many people, the the focus, there's too much focus on cost and that needs to shift to value. Uh, I think that's a great point to wrap up on. Um, So thank you to Craig and to Mike. uh, And thank you so much for our audience for tuning in today to this webinar. Please join us in Boston for the Fund Forum Next Gen Distribution Live Conference. Um, and that's being held October 25th through 27th in Boston. And also, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay at folks' convenience at a later date. Um, so if you want to go back and listen again, or if you have a colleague who wasn't able to tune in live, um, there'll be an email going out with a link to the recording. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>